title of the message tonight is We Need People and People Need Us. We need people and people need us. You've heard the phrase probably, no man is an island. Have you heard that put that way? Does anybody know the rest of that quote? No man is an island. Just curious because I did not know before I looked it up here. Okay, so apparently this comes from a... Uh, I don't know if it's a poem or a prose, I can't remember, but some writing uh, in 1620. Uh, you know how they wrote back in the 1600s? You ever read the King James on uh, tobacco? <laughs> you remember that article? Uh, so needless to say, there's this, uh, this, this work. I don't know if it's a poem or what. It's called Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. And he uses this phrase, and here's what he says. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main, I don't know what the rest of the quote is. But anyway, so there's a lot more to that quote than what we normally uh, say. But no man is an island. I uh, got to thinking about that. said, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent. And then I got to thinking about this. No island is an island. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? You know, you sit in an island, you're thinking, oh, it's totally surrounded by water. I mean, I guess it depends on how you define what an island is. But but really, if you followed that down far enough, I mean, you get on the scuba gear, whatever, you follow that island all the way down, it's touching the surface uh, the, uh, of the sea. And so, like, all of it is connected somehow. There's just water there. And so, uh, you know, we tend to think things are isolated from each other, uh, but really, maybe they're connected. And uh, just this... Last week, uh, we started a series in the life of Moses and Iola. And I started with this because I noticed the birth of Moses actually starts in chapter 2. But chapter 1 kind of gives the setting, the scenario, some of the history. It gives some of the genealogy of the people that we're following and the situation that they're going through with the being enslaved and, and how they came to that and all that kind of stuff. And I remember thinking this, and so I preached this message called, uh, uh, what was the exact title? I can't remember. It was like uh, basically our story began before we were born, something along that, that line. And so if you think about it, uh, you know, when we were born, it's not like poof, we just entered into the earth, but, but entered on, you know, into this life, but we have, you know, some genes that were passed down to us. We've got a situation. We were put in a certain, uh, geography under a certain time period with a certain, uh, geopolitical, uh, you know, Demographic, I'm not demographic. I can't think of the word. Uh, this geo, you know, geopolitics, and uh, in that particular region that they're living in at that time, you know, we happen to be born. I think everybody in here is born in the United States. Was there anybody not born in the United States? So uh, uh, we're probably familiar, you know, with our culture and not so much other cultures, and so. We are born with a certain way of thinking, born into certain families. They have a strong ideology of one, you know, leaning over another. And all those things contributed to who we are as a person and it contributed to our story, if you will. And uh, also, and I'm going to bring this up in the life of Moses, I'm sure, but the people that he had the opportunity in his life to be a part of his life, like he just happens to come across Jethro. Right. And then he meets this man and, and he's and all this. Is, is done. He just happened to be raised by Potiphar's wife and uh, not Potiphar's wife, uh, the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter <laughs> to get my stories mixed up here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just glad I caught it this time. Usually I don't. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, you know, all these different situations that happened made Moses who he was. And it gave him the type of thinking that he, uh, that he has, the type of personality that he has. Uh, obviously, you know, God does a lot of leading in that way and guiding and directing us. Uh, he knows what's good. He has a foreknowledge of us and he understands where we're going to be, uh, you know, down the road because of all of that. Now, he deals with us in the present. We have free will, all that kind of stuff. I, I, I understand that. But he does know. He knows the end from the beginning, and he understands what he's going to do with our life if, if we're believers and how he's going to um, conform us to the image of his son, all those kinds of things. So in our life, sometimes we don't really think about 
how our, you know, the culture that we live in, the things that we did when we were kids or whatever, all contributed to who we are. And we don't think sometimes uh, as much as we should about the people in our life that's influenced us and made us who we are. And, uh, and that's what I want to talk about tonight about how we need people and people need us. This is very important to our stories, if you will. You might think that uh, you want to go through life alone. Not a lot of people would would make that claim, but there are some that you know would say, I just wanna be a hermit, put me on a, you know, a desert island somewhere or put me in a mountain and just let me be by myself. You know, I, I have that quality within me. I love my family and I would never do it, but I have that quality where I think I could survive just by myself because uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, I feel like I could, but then you get me alone for a little while and I'm like, man, I need somebody. I'll get so lost without my wife. <laughs> and uh, and uh, anyway, obviously that's not even a thought right now because I love them so much. But, uh, but you know, you can say that and you could say, oh yeah, man, I, would, I think I would do fine. I just want to be by myself. Like, you know, don't want people around me or whatever. But the thing is, you need people. You need people. And there's nothing you can do about that. Even if you think maybe you don't need people, you need people. So Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 9, said this, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against, uh, I'm sorry, if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And three, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And so we see uh, this mindset. That's probably the best verse I could think of that says, you know, two are better than one. You know, you can't go through life alone. Guess what? Adam needed Eve, <laughs> right? Uh, when we go soul winning, we recommend going with a soul winning partner. You know, you can get by without one, but man, two are better than one. And it's going to help in so many ways. And even when you're on the workforce and you're like, hey, well, this person. Now, there are some people that will slow you way down if you work with them. <laughs> you're kind of unequally yoked, so to speak. But, uh, but you know, if you get that right person and you're working with this person, you know, you're going to get way more done than if you just work separately and they work separately. Now, some people don't think that. Some people think, no, 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 we'll get more done if we just split up and I'll do my work and you do your work. Actually, there's this principle uh, of synergy, you know, that you kind of build off of each other and you help each other and you can get more done with the two, you know, than you could by one and one uh, being isolated. So, so you know, <laughs> one plus one equals greater than two, actually. Okay. <laughs> so uh, in that, in that sense. All right. So even if it is possible you could get along by yourself pretty well. You don't necessarily need uh, these influences in your life. You don't need people. Did you ever think about this? Maybe people need you. Because I guarantee you there are people out. I mean, everybody needs people. Uh, but there are some people out there that need you specifically in their life. Okay, so uh, first point is, is simple. Just two points. Okay, we ought to acknowledge and be thankful for the people who we have uh, who have been part of our lives in our past. We need to be thankful and acknowledge the fact that they've been part of our life. Number two, we ought to do the best that we can to be the part uh, to be part of the life of others. Okay, so let's go through here, look at some Bible verses and talk about some people who have obviously been instrumental in our life. And number one, obviously parents, right? We wouldn't be here without our parents. And uh, of course, we needed them for sure. And I would uh, add to that, you know, sometimes people were born and then for whatever reason, they don't have their parents anymore, but they have a, maybe a guardian of some sort uh, uh, who has raised them and taken care of them, or maybe it's their grandparents or whatever. And they're thankful for them as their parents. You know, they think uh, uh, about the work that they've done for them and raising them. Uh, but, you know, most of us, I think in this room, we have our parents. We needed them in our life uh, and, and, and they were there for us. And so the Bible shows us that because of that, we need to honor our parents. Okay, I mean, we have to recognize and acknowledge 
that we needed our parents and we need to honor them because of that. Okay, so it says in Exodus chapter 10, verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Look at Proverbs chapter 23. And I think this is interesting. I've, I'm sure I've said this before, but you know, if you take the uh, Ten Commandments, you can pretty much split them up five and five. You know, the first five have to do with our relationship with the Lord, and the last five have to do with our relationship with man. Don't kill, don't steal, no committing adultery, and uh, don't you know, don't uh, bear false witness. Okay. And so, what about the first five? The last one is, "Thou shalt not." Uh, uh, I'm sorry, thou shalt honor thy mother and thy father. You say, well, how why is that in the first five? Now, maybe I'm making a bigger deal out of this than it is. But why would that be in the first five having to do with our relationship with God? Well, here's, here's what I think. You didn't choose your parents. <laughs> you, know, you had no say over who was, going, you know, who was going to bear you. And so you were born into the family that God put you. You had no choice about it. And so I believe that part of our, even if somebody is raised in a home where, man, they just don't like life with their mom and dad. Uh, I never understood that. Growing up, you know, I loved my mom and dad. It was the best place. I thought everybody in the world wanted to be, wanted to live in my house and, and all that. And so, like, that's just the way that I thought. And so, if I ever had any friends that said, I just hate my parents. You know, I wish I had your parents or something like that. I'm like, what in the world did you just say? Like, God's going to strike down lightning on you or something because those are the parents that God gave you. You don't have any choice about that. You say, well, you don't understand. They do this and they do that. You need to acknowledge that you needed them and God put them in your life and you should be thankful that they have been a part of your life. Uh, so Proverbs chapter 23. Oh, man, I hate when I... I always think I can find it while I'm talking and then I somewhere get sidetracked. Proverbs... 23 and go to verse 22. Not only do we need to honor them, but we need to hearken unto them. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. So, you know, we have kind of like a lifelong responsibility to honor our parents. Now, obviously, when you leave the house, you get married, you have your own family, you're not under their authority anymore, but you still honor them and respect them. They're your parents, and uh, you needed them in, in your life. You, acknowledge, you need to acknowledge that, and you need to be thankful for all that they have done. That's an obvious one, okay? We, we, we need to uh, be thankful for our parents. Number two is, uh, this, or the second person here that I... Uh, this is terrible, but I forgot to uh, type this one out. And I was like, oh man, I forgot. And I had to squeeze this in. So if you're looking here, it looks like a, an afterthought. Like, oh yeah, my spouse. <laughs> but it's not. I just uh, messed up in my type. Okay, anyway, uh, that second, because, you know, I'm thinking about Adam and Eve, right? And Adam and Eve, you know, Adam was given a wife. I mean, she was the greatest woman in the world, right? Also the worst woman in the world. But he, he, had, uh, he had Eve. And this was his help, his helper, and she, you know, was there to, to help out his job, make his life easier. They loved each other, all this kind of stuff. And what's he do? He throws her under the bus as soon as, uh, as, soon as he's accused of something. He's like, you know, it's this woman you gave me. It's her fault, all right? But, uh, but the Bible has a lot to say about our spouses and husbands supposed to love your wives and wives are supposed to honor your husband. Uh, uh, Wives are supposed to submit to your to their husbands. Look at Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter five. And go to verse twenty-two. <clears throat> Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You say, "Well, you just don't know my husband. You know, he's just hard to live with." That, the Bible doesn't say, like, unless he's hard to live with, and then you don't, you know, and then you don't have to. No, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. Right? The way I, I read that, because I don't think it's just saying, like, you know, your husband is basically your God, and you just need to put him on a pedestal, and you need to. That's not what I'm saying. I think he's saying, like, as unto the Lord, meaning, like, you know, love your husband because you love the Lord. <laughs> right? You're now in this 
marriage relationship, whatever the case. Now, you go back in the Bible days, and a lot of times people got married in sort of like an, an arranged type marriage. Like you didn't really have a choice. Like you're the a lot of times the daughter was just kind of given away because the parents said, you know, sometimes because they could make a profit off of it or whatever. Who knows what the case was? And they would give uh, that wife away. Do you know that Paul, when talking to the Ephesians, was probably talking to some people who didn't necessarily have a choice and even in who they got married to? Uh, no doubt, he's talking to people and they're in that marriage relationship, and he's like, wives, submit yourselves unto your husband. What you don't understand, he's to as unto the Lord, right? Well, I mean, if nothing else, like in the back of your mind, just be like, I'm submitting to you only because I love the Lord. <laughs> and it's by submitting unto you, I'm submitting unto the Lord. Okay. And so, uh, so wives are to submit their, their, their selves unto their husband, which means they need to acknowledge that this is my spouse and I need my spouse and be thankful for your spouse. Okay, that God has given you. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be, so, uh, be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, that's a huge love. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of love that he would die for sinners like us and he would uh, give of himself. And so you see this, this, you know, some husband you can picture in your mind and he's just like, uh, you know, well, you don't understand. Like I, she's a hard woman to love and, and she doesn't do this and she doesn't do that. And I wish she would do this. And it's like, no, 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 you need, you need to love her. You need her. And it's interesting. Like this is a, this is, it isn't it amazing how the Bible is always right? <laughs> okay, so so here's what the Bible teaches. Okay, uh, this this principle. If you follow this principle, here's what you find: the more that the wife submits herself to her husband, the more that the husband loves the wife, and the more that the husband loves the wife, the more that the wife's like, man, it's a whole lot easier to submit to him whenever he loves me and treats me right. <laughs> okay, and so it's just like, hey, you do your part, and don't be like, well, they're not doing their part. No, no, you do your part. Well, it's 50-50. No, it's not. It's 100-100, okay? You do 100%, they do 100%. If they're doing 80%, you still try to do 100%. If they're doing 50% or 20%, you still try to do 100%. And just in case you know that you can't go higher than 100%. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, you, 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 know, you need to love your spouse and be thankful for them. By the way, you know, unless you're disobeying the Bible, it's the only one you got. Okay, so once you're married, you need to honor them and be thankful for them and acknowledge that you need them. You need them. <clears throat> How about pastors? I hate, I hate this because I always feel like it's self-serving, but we're going with the Bible here. Our pastors, Bible teachers, preachers, the one that led you to the Lord, uh, the preacher that you listen to who has taught you a whole lot online. I mean, whatever the case, you know, but particularly I want to talk about elders right here for a second. First Timothy 5, 17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Okay, so I guess somebody could... Uh, you know, maybe debate as to whether or not they rule well, but whatever the issue, uh, you know, you should be thankful for the person who has taken the charge over you and over the assembly and is doing their best to feed you spiritually and to look out for you and to make sure that you're doing okay and, and uh, you know, tolerate different things about you, just like you got to tolerate different things about them. Uh, it's similar relationship. In, in in some ways to the, the whole husband and the wife wife thing. I mean, obviously it's it's not exactly the same, but uh, you know, it's kind of like a it's like kind of like a commitment, you know. And I, you know, I remember when I first became a pastor, like I want I, 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 in, at Iola. Of course, this work hasn't hadn't started yet, and I remember thinking like, I want you to want me to be your pastor. Okay, we have this thing in our bylaws that says you have to take a vote and the vote has to, uh, you have to have like a 75% majority, which basically means this, that in a, in a church the size of our church, one or two people can vote no 
And you're not the pastor because, you know, depending on, you know, how small the congregation is, one or two votes is a big percentage, right? And so the first time that they took a vote on me to be a pastor, maybe some of y'all don't know this, at Iola, they said, hey, you know, do we want Brother Rocky to be the pastor of Iola Baptist Temple? And there were two or three no's. And so I didn't be, I wasn't the pastor. And I thought, you know what? I don't really want to be the pastor unless everybody's on board and everybody wants me to be uh, the, the, the pastor. But then again, there was some that were kind of like, uh, you know, we, they were kind of just didn't like me or something like that. And, and, and they didn't like the pastor before me and everything. And so, you know, I kind of felt like that's, it's, it's in a way not fair. It doesn't necessarily represent the whole, but anyway, God's will be done. And so I, I said, no problem. You know, I'll be here if the next preacher that comes wants me to still be a part, you know, as assistant and a, uh, what I would call a deacon really, uh, you know, I'll be happy to. Otherwise I step down. A lot of times a new pastor comes and they don't want to have that extra burden of like working with a person who maybe they don't know anything about each other. They don't get along or something like that. So a lot of times uh, there are some churches that are set up to where when a new pastor comes, like he brings his own staff with him. Like this, like the person is actually following the the pastor along rather than just the, the, the church. So anyway, it's, 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 you know, a lot of churches are, are, you know, a little bit different, but, but uh, so anyway, time went by and the people left that originally uh, did that. And then they said, well, let's take another vote. And they took another vote and I, we still had one vote or two votes, no, but it was enough to for me to still be in there. But I remember thinking like, man, I, I really don't want, who is the who's this person that doesn't want me as their pastor? Because I want to enter into this relationship saying, no, hey, we are all together, man. I'm not forsaking you, you don't forsake us. And and we're gonna be, we're gonna be through this. I just kind of felt like that's the relationship we needed to have. And, uh, and I don't know if they felt the same way uh, towards me, but, you know, I think about this relationship. It's important because this is your leader. You know, this is the, this is the person that's going to lead you, guide you, direct you. Uh, you know, and the Bible tells you to honor them and to respect them. And, uh, you know, the Bible says that, you know, they do it. They watch, uh, you know, they kind of like they're watching for your soul. And so you need to, you know, give them that ability to do that and to try to make that decision uh, that they think is going to be best for you, and if you if you fight them on that, you know, then it could be harder for them to be able to do their do, do their job. Now, I want you to know this as your pastor, just the way that I am. Maybe not every pastor is the same way, but I want to know you, the way you feel. I want to know your heart. I want to know what you think about certain matters. So don't ever think like, well, I don't want to, you know, by you know, not to make his job hard on him or anything. No, no, no. You know, we can talk about these kinds of things. We should so that we can be on the same page because I love you and I hope you love me. And that's the way that we, that's the way that this is going to, to run. So like, you know, one of the qualifications for a pastor is that he's the husband of one wife. And then it says that he has his children uh, in subjection, you know, because how could, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but it says, how can, uh, uh, how if he cannot rule his own house, how can he rule the house of God? So you see, he's 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 kind of saying that he's gonna if he's gonna demonstrate in his own family, you know how he operates with that family. That's gonna be a demonstration of how he's gonna operate in the church family. Because in a lot of ways, it's that same idea. Like uh, you know, we're not we're not Catholic, so you don't call me father. <laughs> but in the Bible, actually, there's a lot of times where there's this idea where like Paul, and I think he's primarily talking about people he actually led to the Lord, but he's like talking about them like he's, he's there, like they're his sons. And, uh, and there's other places, you know, where that kind of terminology is used in the old Testament. They, they, some of them called their, the prophet that they were following their father, uh, uh I just wouldn't call anybody that, okay, except your actual father, because the Bible says uh, not to call any man father. Uh, talking about that from a religious leader's standpoint. Uh, but anyway, sometimes as a pastor, you feel like, man, these are my kids. You know, I want to, you know, I have no greater joy than my kid to know that my kids walk in truth, you know, and, and my children walk in truth, again, paraphrase. But you understand what I'm saying, like, like there's that desire as a pastor to just kind of lead uh, and, and to, and to be a family. And so same thing as a husband and wife, a father to, to children. And so you, you know, hopefully have that same understanding like this, this is the pastor that God's given me. Now, if you feel like it's not, 
obviously there's always, you know, oppor- I mean, situations where someone has to uh, leave, go to another church. And that's happened. That happened in Iola. And I'm sure it's happened to some people here that don't come here anymore. That's just the way that it goes. But ultimately we want to be a, ho- a household that is, uh, is working together. Okay. And you ought to acknowledge that your pastor and the people who have been a part of your life in helping you to know the Bible and to be led spiritually and all that, and you should honor them as well. First Timothy uh, five seventeen. I already read that one. Uh, go to First Thessalonians five. Whew, I was afraid this was the part of Thessalonians where I have a page missing. First Thessalonians five. Look at verse eleven. <clears throat> And that yeast, oh, hold on. I don't think that was what I was looking for. Don't you hate when that happens? Maybe it's 2 Corinthians 5. I mean, 2 Thessalonians 5. Nope, that ain't it. Where was I going? Uh, is it Timothy? Did I just write it down wrong? Timothy 5. Well, I don't know what I did right there. huh? Uh, it talks about esteeming them highly in love. I don't know what I did. I hate when I ever do that. I need to double check that. What's that? Of what? Okay, it is 1 Thessalonians. 5... 13. That's what I originally said. 11 through 13. I don't know what I was reading. Okay. Oh, because I'm reading uh, chapter 4. It, I mean, hey, remember what I said about the... It's, this is why, okay? <laughs> I can't see what I'm doing here. All right. Sorry. So we're in chapter 5, first, starting verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Okay, so the Bible makes it very clear. And this is Paul. Uh, You know, Paul wasn't a pastor. You know, some people argue with you about that. But Paul wasn't a pastor. He was a missionary. And he was going out as uh, under the authority of ascending church. And he was starting churches and then they were ordaining elders who met certain qualifications, which he put in this uh, in the Bible saying like, these are the qualifications of an elder. Okay. And so he wasn't a pastor, but he had a huge part in these people's lives and, you know, led a lot of them to the Lord, got them saved, taught them, uh, you know, how to grow as a Christian and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, and, and typically he's like, you know, hey, whenever I came to you, I didn't even... Uh, you know, I didn't even want to take any money from you. So I worked with my hands so that I wouldn't be a burden on you. And at one point he even says, I think I did you wrong by doing that. And, uh, and all that. So, so you could tell like he didn't necessarily want to uh, tell them, Hey, you need to esteem me and you need to, you know, but he's saying like, you need to do this. You need to do this. It's good for you. And so I can say that as a pastor, uh, you're saying, you know, he, you need to esteem them highly. I'm not saying put them on a pedestal or treat them like they're higher than a man because they're not. All right, but you need to recognize them just like, I mean, to a similar degree, like a child uh, appreciates their parents, like a, hus- a husband and wife appreciate each other. Like, uh, like, you know, so this is just another relationship where we have to have an appreciation. We need to esteem them highly. And I can say that and I can, and I can, you know, like I get a little feel kind of weird, like uh, this is self-serving, but no, look, eventually I suspect you know, Lord willing, somebody's going to come who's going to be the right person to lead this church and be the next pastor. And you know what? My advice to you is take that person in. And once they become your pastor, you esteem them highly and you treat them. They're worthy of double honor if they continue to uh, rule well and labor in the word, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. And so uh, so this is a biblical concept. Okay, You need to acknowledge and be thankful for uh, pastors, Bible preachers, uh, teachers, and all that. Look, there's uh, you know there's people in my life uh, <laughs> from very different perspectives, 
people in my life who are who are in the ministry who now want nothing to do with me, right? You say, oh, I know who you're talking about. No, you, you know, it's, it's lots of people from different, different sides. And you know what? I love them dearly. And I respect what, they, what they've taught me. I'm thankful for what they've taught me. I would still do, I don't want to say anything for them, but I, you know, I, I esteem them highly because I'm thankful for the fact that they contributed to my life, to who I am, through their preaching, through watching their life, watching how they handle certain situations. It has, God used them to help me to grow. And so I feel like I have a responsibility. I need people. And so we need to be thankful for and acknowledge that these people, God used these people in our lives. Okay, how about our peers and our coworkers? Now I'm gonna I'm gonna lump in with that, our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we understand that even at work, okay, you say, well, you don't uh, the guys that I work with, they 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 drink and they cuss and and you know they sleep around they do all these things like like they're not Christians and so like I don't I don't have any respect for them. Well, I understand that, but in the workforce you need each other, <laughs> okay? And you're the Bible also talks about how our relationship uh, of the masters and the I mean the servants and the masters, okay? Now we live in a slightly different system now as far as the labor force goes, but ultimately that's the idea of your your employer. And you and, and you as a as a worker, like you have a responsibility to acknowledge, hey, this person's paying my salary. You know, these people are working with me, helping my job to go better. Now, look, spiritually speaking, yeah, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You know, when you have your chance, uh, obviously, be a witness to them, try to preach to them the gospel. Uh, but ultimately, you know that what's going to be best for your soul. And the people that you want to help the most and contribute to the most are going to be brothers and sisters in Christ. So we're kind of talking about two different schools of thoughts, but the same thing is it's your peers. Okay. It's your, it's, it's those who are around you, your equals quote unquote, even though you're equal with, uh, with these others as well, uh, it, depending on how you're defining that. But we need to, uh, take those who are our fellow laborers, our fellow workers, and we need to be thankful for them. Uh, we need to be thinking of them. We need to be praying for them. We need to be looking out for their well-being, you know, when they need something or, or uh, you know, uh, just whatever. Just pray for them. Pray that their sins will be forgiven so that they're healed, the Bible talks about. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to look out for these people and be thankful for them. Look at uh, F Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 3. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Uh, you know, you can go to the end of just about any letter that Paul writes, and he's mentioning all these people who labor together. And sometimes he's talking about, hey, you're my fellow laborers, and these are my fellow laborers over there. I want you to help them. You know, I want you to edify them because you guys are all my fellow laborers. And so we need, we need each other. We need each other. This is that whole two are better than one. You know, you need somebody to help you work. Uh, you know, kid, children, you need your parents. Uh, husbands, wives, you need your spouse. Uh, church members, you need your pastor. I'm going to go up to a. Uh, I'm going to go up to a uh, church. You know, in Sullivan's, they've been without a pastor for years. And you know what the Bible actually teaches? Like, I I have a heart for that church, and I hope that uh, that something you know can come come about there. But uh, the pastor, the the Bible teaches that a church without a pastor is out of order. I don't mean like they're like do like they're sinning against God or something. I'm saying it's just not organized. It's not it's not where it's supposed to be because they need an elder. They need somebody who can who can take that. It's just kind of like a family without a dad. Can it function? Can it work? Is it still a family? Yes, but it's out of order. There's something missing, you know. Uh, you know, it's like a single parent trying to raise their kids and they don't have their spouse. Like can it, can it work? Yes, but something's missing. And so uh, so we need uh did I, did I repeat myself? Anyway, uh, so so we need uh, to acknowledge that and to to be praying for our our fellow laborers. And I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, look at uh, Philemon uh, Philemon chapter uh, Philemon chapter one. 
Yeah, I was just talking about how the Apostle Paul was just like praying that these people will work together and that they'll uh, they'll be able to accomplish things. Titus and Philemon, chapter 1, verse 24. Again, here he is just listing all these people who are his fellow laborers. He says, Marcus, our... Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Okay, we've got people who we are supposed to be laboring together with. And again, sometimes it gets easy to be like, you know what, I can just do it on my own. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll go soul winning and we'll have uh, an odd group. So we'll have like a team of three. And I tend to be that person that's like, oh, you know what, why don't you guys go knock on that door and I'll go over here and knock by myself on this other door. And on my way up to that door, I'm like, you know what? something's missing here. <laughs> like it can be done. It can be done, but you're like, man, it sure is easier to go soul winning with, with a fellow laborer. And uh, we need each other. We need our fellow laborers. Okay. So, so number one is we ought to acknowledge and be thankful for people who have been part of our lives. Number two, because again, you say, well, you know what? I don't, I don't really need them. I can get by just fine without them. Okay. Well, let's say that you can which you can't, but let's say that you can. Well, have you ever thought about the fact that they need you? You're being selfish by thinking like, well, I don't need them. Well, they need you. And we ought to do the best that we can to be part of the lives of others. Uh, again, fathers, you know, your, your children, they need you. They need you. You can't get so caught up in, uh, in, in just your own thoughts and your own life. And, and, you know, you just, Maybe you get mad or at work or whatever, you come home, take it out on the kids. This happens a lot. Uh, it's, it's normal. We carry that stress. And then, you know, no, your kids need you. Your kids need you. Ephesians 6, 4 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That doesn't mean that uh, a father can't be harsh and firm with their kids. They, he should be. He's their father. He's not their just, just their best friend or something like that. So, uh, so there is a different role that a father has to take. But man, that father's goal is to bring those children up in the nurture and admi admonition of the Lord. He wants them to walk on the right path. And, they, and the, they're not going to do that naturally. They need their parents to guide and direct them. Uh, husbands, your spouse needs you. You know, look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Again, you know, a husband can come home. He can be kind of selfish. You know, you know, I worked all day. I've been busy. I've been so, so here's let's let me just get personal. So, you know, I don't have to point fingers at anybody else uh, because we all have our own stories. Right. But but for me, I work most of the time by myself. I'm studying. I'm by myself. I get a little break. I might, I might go for a run. I'm all by myself. Uh, you know, there's, there's just different things I'm doing by myself. And so I have to remind myself sometimes actually, like, you know what, go home, eat lunch, spend some time with the family. They need you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But sometimes I can be stressed out. Like maybe I made some phone calls. I talked to some people, you know, maybe somebody got mad at me and, and, and all these things happen. And if I'm not careful, like I could come home and just let that weigh on my shoulders and then I bring that stress home and it affects the rest of my family, right? And my spouse, you know, I'm bitter against her and uh, my kids, I'm provoking them into wrath and all this kind of stuff. And look, it all is because I'm not recognizing the fact that, hey, it's not just that I need them, but they need me. They need me. And so I need to be selfless and uh, try to pour myself out to them so that they can uh, get what they need. Uh, you know, you might not be a pastor or a, or a a preacher necessarily, but there are people in your life that you're going to teach, you know, and you need to uh, invest that time teaching somebody. And uh, that was one thing that I missed, I think, but that's another person that there are people that, that taught us in our life. Maybe it was your parents. If you're homeschooled, 
uh, or maybe it was a tutor that you had, like you're homeschool, but there uh, maybe some videos you watched, you know, where somebody took the time to teach you, or maybe you went uh, to some kind of like co-op type thing and other teachers are there. And you need to acknowledge that and be thankful. They contributed to you, uh, even if it's your public education, which I do not recommend anybody go. Uh, but there are public teachers that I had that I'm still thankful for. They did teach me uh, some different things. Okay, but, but you know what? You also have to realize that also there are other people that are needing to be taught by you. There's some things that they uh, need to learn and that you can teach them. Uh, one of the verses that I, I, I really love about... Uh, when it comes to women teachers, okay? Now, obviously, women can preach. They can preach the, the, the gospel. Uh, you know, there's women that can preach better than some men. They can't be pastors, and they can't instruct and teach the men and be outspoken in the church. Like, this is the way that we're going to do things. Uh, but they can certainly teach. They can certainly preach. And the best thing that a woman can do, an uh, older woman can do, is teach the younger women. Okay, look at Titus uh, chapter 2. And I'm going to tell you, one of the reasons why is because I know this, you know, and different people have different feelings about this. I know some guys that spend a lot of time counseling with women and stuff like that, uh, especially younger women or, you know, like closer to my own age or younger. <laughs> I know I'm not young, but <laughs> close to my, my age or younger. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to spend time counseling them. I'm not going to tell them, you know, here's what, here's what I won't do. I won't go up to them and say, hey, uh, that skirt's kind of short, isn't it? You know what I just showed? Like, I'm looking at your legs. <laughs> That's awkward. I'm not going to do that, you know. I'm not going to go up and teach a woman, you know, hey, you shouldn't talk to your, you shouldn't talk to your husband like that. Her husband's right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not, that's not my job. Okay. And so, uh, you know, there are certain things that I won't say to younger women. And so how does the Bible deal, uh, deal with that? I mean, where does the Bible say, hey, this, tell the young ladies this? Well, it doesn't. Here's what it says in, in Titus chapter 2. But speak, the, uh, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in a, a behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their wives, I'm sorry, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. I can't teach a woman how to keep the house. You know, here's the funny thing. I've had a cleaning business for many years. Like in, in Oklahoma City, I had a cleaning business. And uh, in here, I don't necessarily have my own cleaning business, but I've been cleaning some different office buildings and stuff like that the whole time I've been here, what, 11 years or something like that. And... Uh, and, you know, I have a whole lot more accumulated hours of cleaning than my wife. And I don't and I don't hesitate to say that I have cleaned a lot. I've cleaned more toilets than anyone in this room. I've probably cleaned more office buildings and apartment buildings and all that than all of y'all combined together. But my wife's still a better cleaner than I am. <laughs> <laughs> because there are just certain things that women seem to be able to do better than men. And there are men out there, men, uh, who, janitors or whatever, that might argue with me on that. Uh, but look, the women know how to keep the house. Now, there are some exceptions. There are some women that aren't good housekeepers. I understand that. There are some men that might be a little more tidier than others. Uh, but look, I don't know how to teach women how to keep the house. I don't know how to teach them how to properly love their husbands. You know, I'm not going to give him, I, I'm a husband, so I might be able to say like, well, he, he probably wants this or he probably wants that, but I, I'm not going to be able to tell a woman, how to, a young woman how to do that. Uh, I'm not going to tell her how to keep home, how to sew, how to cook, how to clean. That's not, I'm not going to spend any time talking about that. And so it says right here, there's nowhere in here where it says, oh, by the way, you know, teach the young women to love their husbands and love, it doesn't say that. It says teach the older women and Tell them to teach the younger women, <laughs> okay? And so, uh, and so I love that because, you know, the younger women, here's what I'm saying. They need you, older women. They need you to tell them how to do these things. You know, one of the big things that's wrong with women in, of all ages in the United States today is that somewhere down the line, the older women stopped teaching the younger women. And so they just had to figure things out for themselves or learn it from the men that they hang out with or, or learn it from Hollywood, God forbid. And, uh, and, there's, and, and the women today, like just nobody ever taught them. 
And, uh, you know, what, you want some preacher to start telling these women how they're supposed to be? That's not going to go over very well. I mean, you could preach what the Bible says, and, and that's always going to stand firm. But what's going to be a lot better is for an older woman to say, oh, by the way, let me show you how to do this. You know, let me show you how to take care of this. And, uh, and, and, and so there's somebody that needs you. And a lot of times women are just like, hey, you know, I got so much to go, uh, so much to do. I got to take care of my house and I got to do this. Well, don't forget that there's somebody out there that probably needs to be taught. Of course, your kid, your children need to be taught, but uh, there's a, a, other young ladies probably need you to teach them. And older and men, the same thing. Older men are going to have to teach the younger men how to do some things and how to tie a fishing knot and stuff like that. I mean, important stuff. <laughs> All right. I'm just kidding. Kind of. So, uh, uh, so also, uh, preachers, you know, somebody needs you to preach to them. Somebody needs you to be their pastor. Obviously there's only one person in here that applies to, okay. Your peers, your coworkers, they need you. They need you to be a good worker. You know, I don't need to just go around just complaining about hey, every other worker on this job is bad. And you know what I find that the people that go around complaining about all the other workers that are sitting there not getting anything done, they're like the worst workers. <laughs> They're just going around complaining about all their coworkers. And it's like, hey, here's what you need to know. Your coworkers need you to step up and help them out. And then everybody get along fine. You'll have, uh, you'll have some good, uh, good work. All right, Hebrews 10, verse 24, and we're done. Hebrews 10. In this context, he's particularly going to go in here and say, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. In other words, we need church family. We need to go to church. We need to have iron sharpening iron, all that kind of stuff. And chapter 10, verse 24 says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Okay. So not only do we need to be thankful and acknowledge the people in our lives that have contributed to who we are, and we do need to do that. But also we need to acknowledge that even if, even if like you're, you're just sidestepping all of that and you're not thankful and you don't help people out and you, I mean, you don't, uh, uh, you know, you're not, you're not thankful for what they've done to you and all that. Well, you still need to understand that, you know, people need you, people need you. And I always think about this, like, uh, a gym membership, you know, uh, somebody would join a gym and if, you know, maybe they got a little group that goes and works out together, or maybe there's a running group and, and, uh, you know, they got to get up every morning and they go out and they're going to work together or whatever. Some of, some of it's a joke. I remember going to this one health club where these old people got together to go work out every morning, but you know what they did? They sat around this table and they ate donuts and drank coffee. <laughs> I think they just told their spouses, Hey, I'm going to work. I'm going to jail. I'm going to work out. And they just got together with their buddies and they just sat there and, and drank. But anyway, when you do do that, a lot of times you're just like, hey, I, I don't need this. And look, I'm not telling you to go join a gym, but I'm just saying a lot of people join these running groups or these gyms or whatever. And they're like, you know, I need accountability. And it's like, you need me and I need you. Otherwise, if we're just like, hey, I can do this at home, you won't ever do it. And so we need each other. We need accountability. And so this is the idea, like provoke one another unto good uh, work. That's why we need to meet in church. I, I get so frustrated. I know things going on in different people's lives. Uh, you know, busy, lots of work, kids, all this kind of stuff. But, you know, when people don't show up, I mean, it's not like every week you can just count and just expect 100% attendance. But when people don't show up, you're just like, oh, man, you know, we need each other. We need each other. And so, but things do come up. But, hey, well, if you can't come, I mean, get back into church because the longer you're away from church, the longer you're away from those influences in, in your life, uh, the more it's going to hinder you. And not just that. Hey, while we're sitting here at church, like thinking, oh man, you know, those people, they really need us. You're like, why aren't they here? They really need us. No, no, no. We need them. We need them. And so whenever they come, it helps the atmosphere and it helps everybody uh, uh, to strengthen one another and to, to walk in the uh, calling that we've been called to. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we do thank you for the people in our lives that you've you've put there, many of which we had no choice over the matter, uh, but they've contributed to our lives one way or another. We've learned from it. We've grown stronger. Uh, we've gotten smarter. And Lord, we give you thanks for them. I pray that you help us to treat uh, them with the honor and respect and, uh, and uh, esteem them with the, uh, to the amount that, that we, we deserve, I mean, that they deserve. And I pray, Lord, also that you'll help us to realize that we 
um, that um, that we need to be there for other people as well, and that we would do our best to be an encouragement and to provoke others unto uh, good works. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this day, and I pray you be glorified in this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.